Hello, everyone, and welcome to the College of Environment and Design at the University of Georgia. I am very honored today to, to open our annual lecture series. Uh, of course, when we first dreamed it up, we hoped that all these wonderful lectures are going to be in person, but life surprised us. Um, and so we are trying this mode of operation, and I am confident uh, that uh, we actually will have many participants and the wonderful lecture uh, will be followed by many um, exciting questions. So this is really a great time for us to share some of our research, some of our faculty research, uh, starting with uh, Professor Don Nadenicic, who of course most of you know um, is our former dean and uh, I'm so very honored I have been for the last two years to actually uh, follow um, into his lead. Um, so um, Dan, as you know, uh, holds the Draper Chair of Landscape Architecture in the College of Environment and Design. He had a very uh, distinguished career, uh, of course, before he came to us at the University of Georgia. And he served as chair of the Department of Planning and Landscape Architecture and the Community Revitalization Director of the Restoration Institute at Clemson University. And previously, he was also director of the Center for Studies in Landscape History at Penn State. So we were very lucky to steal him uh, from Clemson. He is widely published in the areas of landscape history and theory in such very prestigious venues such as a landscape journal, uh, landscape and Urban Planning, uh, Pioneers of American Landscape Design, 19th Century Studies, uh, Journal of the New England Garden History Society, and from the studio to the streets, service learning in planning um, and architecture. He also served for five years as co-editor of the Landscape Journal and currently edits the, a library of American landscape history book series titled Critical, per Critical Perspectives in the History of Environmental Design. He is currently completing the final chapter uh, of his book, which is officially under contract with the University of Georgia Press. And the book is called Cultivating American Civilization, Frederick Billings and 19th Century Land Planning. Now, um, it is I think many of you know that Dan is going to retire after this year, so uh, we, of course, will uh, be very sad not to have him officially as part of our faculty. He will naturally become emeritus, but uh, I think all of us should buy his book when it's available, and I am now making a pledge, Dan, that I will invite you to talk about your book just as well. Okay. Um, the current lecture is actually on another topic which I believe you see, it's called Georgia Equalization Schools between 1950 and 1970. So it's a separate research project, but again, uh, I think that the book also uh, be a great um, event if uh, Dan would agree to share some of his findings. Um, I want to very briefly also touch, on, touch upon some logistics here. Um, you know, this is a new way of lecturing for us. So um, please submit your questions using the Q&A option, uh, or you can also raise your hand. And then, of course, uh, Dan will select uh, the question to answer, and we will move on the discussion forward this way. So thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you, Dan, again, for agreeing to open our series this year. Well, thank you, Sonia. It's a real pleasure. And um, I, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen right away so that we uh, don't spin wheels here. So let me uh, uh, bring up. So I'm assuming everybody can see this. Uh, I assume if, um, if uh, Tom and uh, Sonia can see it, everybody can. You guys can see it? We're good, yes. OK. So uh, the reason I wanted to do uh, equalization schools really has to do with the sign of the times. Uh, when Sonia and I were talking about this originally, I did think that I probably would do uh, a discussion of what I'm doing right now uh, in writing my book. But things have changed a lot. Uh, 2020, as you all know, was, was quite a year. And uh, thankfully, we're, we're on the road to 20. 21 
So we have this uh, sort of straight bridge that'll take us uh, into the uh, into the next year, uh, hopefully without this impediment uh, in the way. But in thinking about this last year uh, and how everything changed, uh, not only uh, the pandemic and how we're trying to teach. Uh, on the left there, you have uh, gear that I never thought I'd ever have to use as a landscape architecture teacher. Uh, masks and, uh, and uh, thermometers and so forth. In fact, I never thought I'd be in a classroom where all of my students wore masks and I was wearing a mask while I spoke to them. But the pandemic is only part of what we're dealing with. And remember, this is a 100 year event. Uh, we haven't had a pandemic like this in the world since 1918. And then there's a 50 year event, uh, which was spurred in part by the inequity that uh, everybody sees in, a, in a, a graph like this about who's getting sick and who's dying of COVID. Uh, it's really interesting to look uh, at the numbers. Uh, for example, um, you know, the uh, African Americans are, are dying at twice, more than twice the rate uh, that uh, white Americans are dying. And then, of course, uh, everything exploded uh, after the George Floyd incident in Minneapolis. And so you have this 50 year event happening where there are all these mass protests all across the country and internationally. And it really has been since the um, Vietnam War era, since we've seen anything this massive. And so because of that, uh, I really started to think about how we need to rethink how we talk about our own histories and planning and landscape architecture and preservation. And it really made me uh, sort of dig back into some of my other experiences. And that's why I want to talk to you about equalization schools. But before I do that, uh, I think what we need to do as we look at a couple of heroes uh, in the history of landscape architecture is think about these people as whole people, not just uh, hero designers and so forth and tell the real story about who they were and what they did. And so, for example, the person on the left, Warren Manning, um, was an outstanding designer. I'm actually working on a project that he did, uh, Mill Pond Plantation um, in Thomasville, in that, in that area. But if you look at uh, his language uh, and his descriptions in writing and so forth, by every measure today, uh, Mr. Manning was a racist. Uh, Olmsted, on the other hand, uh, uh, was not uh, someone who um, showed a whole lot of uh, prejudice against African-American people, although he certainly had a paternalistic attitude. But uh, Native Americans was a whole nother story. He had a real uh, perspective on the importance of civilization. Whenever you think about civilization, that means that there are uh, a hierarchy of human beings on the list and at the bottom of that hierarchy were Native Americans. So I can go on and on and on about this. And all I'm saying is that as we do our research, let's tell the whole story and just let people decide on what that means and how it fits into our perspective on what uh, folks did. So that then leads me to my talk, Georgia's Equalization Schools, 1950 to 1970. Uh, going back almost a decade, uh, I started to look into this uh, and it was because I was on the state's National Register Review Board working with the Historic uh, Preservation Division within uh, DNR. And uh, I got interested in working with some folks uh, in uh, HPD uh, and started doing uh, some research. And I'll, I'll talk about the individuals that influenced me uh, in a little bit. But the way to start to think about this is think about your drive around the state. When you uh, go out into the countryside or maybe in other parts uh, of the state, uh, even some suburban areas, uh, you will begin to see uh, masonry buildings with a, a brick facade uh, in very harsh condition. Uh, uh, originally, obviously, they had glass 
uh, curtain uh, walls and, uh, and were done in a particular style reminiscent of uh, modernist buildings of the international style period. So let me just show you a few of those so you get a sense of what we're talking about. Here's one from the inside. These buildings, uh, as school buildings, uh, were built with, without all of the amenities. In other words, you often would see uh, these uh, trusses on the ceiling. Uh, uh, block walls would simply be painted rather than some sort of uh, lath and, and sheetrock or uh, plaster put up. But here again, you can see the structure, uh, masonry structure with uh, the uh, glass curtain wall. Another one. And then a few that I can uh, name. Uh, uh, here's uh, one in Horry County, Georgia, uh, Zion Elementary in Jonesboro, Georgia. And these are buildings that have obviously been abandoned for a long time. They're in very tough condition. Uh, and uh, it starts to beg the question, uh, Good Hope School, Walton County, what are these things? What are they remnants of? What should we do with them, if anything? Uh, any of you who are from Georgia knows that this is not Vienna High, it's Vienna High, an industrial school in Vienna, Georgia. And then uh, the beginnings of all of this. So uh, former employees of HPD, uh, Gene Syriac um, has undertaken and uh, I think completed a statewide survey of extant equalization schools in Georgia. Steve, uh, Stephen Moffson was a former architectural historian in HPT, HPD, and he and I collaborated on, on this study after, uh, to give Steve credit, he had done a lot of um, groundwork because he had been in, jar in charge of putting forth uh, some of these structures uh, to the National Register and had worked with uh, various communities. And so I wanna make sure I give those folks credit uh, Gene has uh, since retired, and I think Stephen Mawson has uh, moved on to another state. Uh, I'm not sure where he is. I think he went uh, to um, uh, New Mexico. So there's a couple of contexts that I think are worth thinking about, at least from a preservation perspective. In recent years, uh, we've become may way more interested in the preservation of the recent past, of modernist structures of different types. And of course, what that means is that as you look at these school buildings in Georgia, which have a very distinct purpose that's going to be, as I'll argue, connected to civil rights era, connected to the Jim Crow era in uh, Georgia, and a number of other things, uh, are still a kind of a ubiquitous building form that you can find all over the country. So when I was in middle school, I went to school in a building like this in Austin, Minnesota. And uh, here um, on the right is a building in Indiana, just to show you that these structures were built all over the country. But again, there's a very different twist to what these buildings are all about in Georgia. Here's an image of one of the Georgia buildings uh, from the interior looking out through the glass wall. And so another context is simply that many of the uh, signs and symbols of the Jim Crow era have been uh, taken out of the landscape. The uh, two drinking fountains, uh, the whites only sign, uh, the theaters that are only for colored people and so forth, you can't find. So there are only a few things that are still extant. Uh, one of those that you've heard a whole lot about are the Civil War memorials. And I'm gonna just say a word or two about that and then move on. Uh, and then the other are these uh, extant uh, equalization schools that are still, uh, although they're in bad shape, they're still all over the state. So, um, what we're looking at here uh, in the top image is uh, DeKalb County. And uh, to the right was the first attempt to contextualize the Civil War Memorial by talking about the Lost Cause uh, era, uh, the uh, 
racist uh, connection uh, to uh, some of these uh, Civil War monuments and so forth. And then more recently, actually the removal of uh, that monument uh, on a judge's order. Uh, and then uh, below, and this, uh, this is uh, pretty interesting, I think. These are, uh, this is from the Southern Law Poverty, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. And it shows when the majority of these uh, Confederate memorials were built in the United States, and then it's color coded. So for example, um, the, the blue color there uh, represents on public land at courthouses and other government lands. So there's a really important um, era here that starts in uh, the 1890s uh, with a very important uh, Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson was the Supreme Court case that legalized and legitimized the idea of separate but equal. And then look at the explosion of those memorials after that court case and look at how many of them are in blue on public properties uh, throughout the United States or throughout the Southern states and, so, and, and some other states too, but most of them in the South. And then um, you get another blip uh, after World War I when you have uh, a number of African-Americans coming back from the war effort, uh, trying to get uh, more rights. Uh, and then uh, the final blip comes uh, beginning in the 1950s after Brown versus the Board of Education, which uh, is the Supreme Court case that says, no, separate can never be equal. Uh, separate is inherently uh, unequal and called for the integration of uh, schools and, and so forth in the United States. So these uh, are extant reflections of this era, but so are the equalization schools. And I wanna suggest that the equalization schools aren't laden with a lot of the same sort of baggage uh, that uh, these uh, Confederate memorials have, which begs the question again, from a preservation point of view, what should we do with them, if anything? So let's uh, move further into the context, and that is the Jim Crow era in American uh, civilization, again, especially in the Southern states. Um, the Jim Crow name comes from early 19th century minstrel shows and, and the like. Uh, and it led uh, to a number of laws after Plessy versus Ferguson. This whole list of laws uh, uh, I put together, um, they're from various southern states, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Texas, and so forth. Uh, and I, I just cobbled them together because it really doesn't matter. Even though these laws are different in their specifics, they're all alike in their intent. And so this, this list uh, is really interesting in the sense that it's about uh, African-American behavior. Uh, a black male could not offer his hand to shake the hands of a white male because it implied being socially equal. Uh, obviously, a black male could not offer his hand to uh, or any part of his body to a white woman because of the risk of being accused of rape. And you can go down this list about, you know, lighting a, a cigarette, uh, show, shows of affection, how you would uh, dress one another, uh, Jim Crow etiquette said that blacks uh, were introduced to whites, never the other way around. So for example, Mr. Peters, the white person, this is Charlie, the black person that I spoke to you about. And uh, whites did not use courtesy titles uh, with any respect for blacks, for example, Mr., Mrs., Miss, etc., cetera, uh, or even ma'am, blacks would be called by the first names. Uh, so th these are behavior kinds of uh, regulations. And then there are these laws that really showed what they could do and what they couldn't. So parks, for example, in the top one, uh, there were parks for white people and par parks for black people. And there the twain should meet. Uh, the second one I find really interesting. Any person who shall be guilty of printing, publishing, or circulating printed, typewritten, or written matter urging or presenting 
for public acceptance or general information arguments or suggestions in favor of social equality or intermarriage uh, between whites and Negroes shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and fine $500, face six months in prison, or perhaps both. Um, about passenger stations and providing separate waiting rooms, about marriage, and about, and what we're really interested in is separation of public schools. So uh, after World War II, of course, you have a whole nother generation of GIs coming back, thinking that uh, things needed to change uh, in America. Uh, and then you have uh, the beginning of a civil rights movement. Uh, you have a number of things happening, uh, like the killing of Emmett Till uh, in Mississippi uh, and uh, various protests starting uh, beginning um, early on in the 50s, but really taking off with the civil rights era as, as we get into the 1960s. By the way, Emmett Till um, was a young man, a young African-American boy who uh, was staying with some family in Mississippi. Uh, supposedly, although there's no evidence of this, he whistled uh, at a white woman. In the middle of the night, he was taken from his bed uh, and killed, uh, wrapped in, um, in uh, barbed wire and thrown, weighted down and thrown into the river. Uh, the body was reclaimed uh, by his mother in Chicago, who had uh, an open casket uh, funeral, uh, if you can imagine that. Uh, and it was a major event in calling attention uh, to what was going on in African American communities. So in 1956, uh, 1954, I'm sorry, um, you have Brown versus the Board of Education uh, in Kansas. But this was really the culmination of a whole bunch of court cases, several of them at state levels. Uh, this was the Thurgood Marshall uh, case that went to the Supreme Court. And uh, you get books like this, Black Monday, uh, because the decision was made on a Monday the term Black Monday was previously used for the beginning of the Great Depression, and now in the South it's being used uh, for this uh, Supreme Court case, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. So even though it didn't happen until 1954, many states in the South began to prepare for this eventuality, that there were going to be these court cases and there was going to be intervention from the federal government. So um, what's interesting is uh, this graphic uh, says a lot, I think, because you, know, you always uh, look at the, the Georgia flag that flew from 1956 to 2001 as a reflection of the Civil War era with the uh, uh, Southern Cross. But in fact, it didn't fly over the state of Georgia until this era, uh, 1956 to the year 2001. And what's more than that, um, there was this thinking about what we should do about education. Well, there were a couple of things that were really driving the way people like Govern Governor Herman Talmadge, uh, who actually wrote his own segregation book, shown on the right, thought about how we should provide for public ed education. And uh, for one thing, uh, you know, Georgia was looked down upon in other parts of the United States for being behind in education for everybody. But then there was this need to actually prove that separate but equal was working in the state of Georgia. Uh, at one point after Brown versus the Board of Education, there was actually a, a piece of legislation, uh, an amendment actually to the constitution that was passed uh, that was a private school plan. There was a there was an idea that, well, let's just privatize everything and then we don't have to worry about providing any kind of education uh, that would have to be integrated. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then, uh, as I said, there were these various lawsuits like uh, Briggs versus Elliott that led to Brown versus the Board of Education. But instead of private uh, school planning, uh, what really happened was uh, this uh, minimum foundation program for education was funded. And uh, so you get the beginning of a huge change in how the state of Georgia looks uh, at education. 
And so, um, and by the way, you have these equalization schools in other states, South Carolina and Mississippi, but none of them had any, anywhere close to the investment that Georgia put into these buildings. So in 1951, Talmadge passes a 3% sales tax. There had been no sales tax in Georgia before that time. And by 1955, and you got to put this, uh, this number in, uh, in a 1955 mindset to get a, an idea how much money this was, uh, $275 million was spent on public schools. So more than 50% of the state budget went to education during the 1950s and 1960s, and hundreds of new schools were built for African Americans during this period. All of the same uh, uh, international style uh, format. So the schools we built in this promotion uh, in brochures and flyers and everything else led to this massive uh, uh, structural change and you know you talk about planning a state you know this was a huge huge undertaking that took place so let's let's turn to what african americans had for schools prior to uh 1950 or so so uh this is from the department of education in georgia from 1952 an annual report and you see all of those dots uh, representing one, two, uh, three, and four, uh, and five teacher schools. Most of them were one and two uh, teacher schools in small buildings uh, and shacks. Um, interesting graphics here. Uh, the first school for American students in St. Mary's, Georgia, uh, and then uh, this one uh, that uh, actually uh, Stephen had found, uh, 1941 Negro School in the backwoods of Georgia, uh, to give you an idea uh, what it was like. Uh, the only saving grace to any quality education uh, during this period uh, came from uh, the Rosenwald Fund of, of uh, Sears Roebuck fame, uh, contributed to uh, 5,000 schools or more. Uh, in 15 southern states uh, for a number of years, uh, dating back, uh, you know, to the 19 uh, teens. Uh, and um, they provided really structurally sound buildings, uh, educational material, training uh, for teachers and, and so forth uh, that was helpful, but it wasn't clearly enough, especially as you get to the post-World War II period. So in 1955, um, an article in the Journal of Negro Education reported that Negro school buildings either are past the remodeling stage or would require extensive and expensive renovations to meet a reasonable standard of efficiency. Because of the lack of classrooms in 1,086 instances, Negro teachers are working in the same classroom and uh, 710 or 23.1% uh, of Negro schools are housed in dilapidated churches, tenant houses, or other privately owned bu buildings, which were neither constructed nor equipped for school use. So the plan then, which was largely fulfilled uh, for Negro uh, schools, as they were called then, today Black or African American schools, called for the consolidation of uh, 2,310 schools that existed in 1951 into 511 school centers, 322 elementary, 163 elementary and high school combination, and 26 high schools only. Uh, the plan also called for 13,000 new classrooms in 1,200 new buildings, but also uh, other existing buildings where they could plan for additions uh, and so forth. And again, that plan was largely achieved uh, during the 1950s and into the early 1960s. Uh, only a few constructed in the later 1960s because by that time you get more and more desegregation happening. And by uh, 1970, uh, there 
there was uh, the ruling that no more federal funds would come unless integration happened. And that was pretty much the end date uh, in Georgia. So it's really interesting, I think, to uh, look at these two uh, images side by side. Uh, you have uh, this dispersal of, of African-American groups all over the state of Georgia in the left-hand image and the uh, consolidation into communities uh, that never existed before uh, after uh, the, um, the uh, equalization school movement uh, takes hold. It's a massive change, not only in terms of constructing these, these uh, structures, but what it does to African-American neighborhoods and communities. They came together uh, for the first time uh, because of these schools. As all of you can imagine, the school was the center of life in many communities, uh, African-American and white, both. So the ground gets broken. Uh, in both the African-American and the school uh, buildings that uh, were built for white students. Um, and they looked exactly alike, at least on the outside. So a school building authority was set up that adopted standards for classrooms and other school facilities. And it established design standards uh, for the types of construction, fire safety, lighting, sanitation, and, all, and so forth. So that in uh, 1952, the New York Times reported that Georgia's model type Southern schoolhouse was a brick faced concrete block structure with ample light and windows. This was a massive effort. One example, on the same day in December of 1955, DeKalb County in the Atlanta metro area dedicated 10 new elementary schools and three new high schools Five of those schools were intended to replace uh, identified colored schools in extremely poor condition, while the other schools uh, were for white students. So here, here are the images. So the uh, buildings on the left and the right are, those eight are white schools, and the five in the middle, African-American schools. So what do you see? Uh, you see a particular format that gets done over and over again. Uh, U-shaped structures, uh, one-story, sometimes two-story buildings, sometimes E-shaped structures, sometimes just L-shaped, uh, depending on whether it was in an urban environment or a rural environment. So uh, they were built, and they were built fast. This is East River School in Atlanta. The architects, Stevens and Wilkinson, uh, from their selected works, uh, this E-shaped e e structure uh, with a um, auditorium and gymnasium off to the right. By the way, uh, the auditorium and gym gymnasium only came if they could raise extra money. Every school got a library, classrooms, and a cafeteria. Sometimes those cafeterias were called uh, cafetoriums because they were also used uh, as auditoriums uh, as well. And uh, this was a windfall for a few architectural firms in Georgia. For example, Stevens and Wilkinson, and there were a few others, uh, were able to uh, design 150 of these buildings uh, throughout Georgia uh, that landed in 26 different uh, counties uh, throughout the state. Just to give you all a view of what they were, uh, this is East River School, Harrison High School, West Point, Georgia, again, uh, Stevens and Wilkinson. East View Elementary School in Americas, again, masonry structure, glass curtain walls, uh, international style. Uh, a plan view of uh, East View, and then, uh, an interior shot. And this is the uh, image that was on uh, the promotional material for uh, this lecture. Uh, but look at the light. Um, they were planned uh, to have lots of light coming in windows, skylights, other sources, so that uh, there was plenty of natural light, uh, very much in keeping with modernist design ideals, but again, equally 
uh, driving the designs for the African-American schools and the white schools. Another image of a classroom. And uh, outside uh, in one of the courtyard spaces, a plan for Beacon Elementary School in Decatur, here an L-shaped structure. So here's the true story. Well, on the surface, the schools appeared to be nearly the same as white schools with courtyards, outdoor gathering spaces, glass curtain walls, sanitary uh, you know, bathrooms and all of the things that were needed. Uh, uh, the black schools were most often poorly located, many times in industrial sections of the community. Those schools were almost always inadequately staffed and supplied. Uh, you know, the books they got were often sort of hand-me-down books uh, shipped from the north or other places. Uh, they, uh, on the inside, how they functioned was nothing like their white counterparts. Nevertheless, in African-American communities, these schools and their landscapes became a nexus for black society and culture to blossom in a way that it never had in Georgia. Here you see um, one of the types of locations where they were built around rail lines, industrial plants, uh, warehouses, cemeteries such as at Carver High School in Carrollton, uh, Carroll County, Georgia. Uh, and then this is E.E. E. Butler High School in Gainesville, uh, built in 1962 and abandoned uh, just a few years later. And I'll tell you that story. But here's a great example of one of the schools that became this home for uh, a new cultural expression in African-American communities that just hadn't been allowed to flourish in this way before. So uh, all of the things that you would ex expect to happen in high schools throughout the United States were beginning to happen in these schools. Football, uh, homecoming queens, uh, cultural programs. Uh, this one is interesting, uh, African Americans interpreting uh, Native American culture in a play. Uh, football practices, football games, uh, cheerleaders. Uh, all of the things, again, that you would expect everyone to have uh, in a high school. Uh, high school band. Um, and then uh, before game time, the band would walk down the street and, or march down the street uh, playing music. And that was a signal to African-American businesses to close up shop because it was game day. And uh, people would close their stores. Uh, to uh, attend uh, the football game. Business uh, club and other clubs, uh, uh, laboratories that they never had before to teach science, uh, and then adult classes. So many of these schools were actually open 18 hours a day so that you could move into the late evening hours uh, and, uh, and there would be adult classes of different types uh, happening uh, in the evenings. And of course, uh, for a lot of uh, African-American children, uh, this was the first time they were able to get good uh, meals uh, at school uh, as well. But then, uh, as I said, by the time you get to uh, 1970, you have uh, desegregation uh, being uh, pretty much uh, uh, all the way through um, the state of Georgia. That doesn't mean you really get integration because you get a flourishing of uh, all kinds of academies and that kind of thing. But uh, nevertheless, uh, there were great changes that happened. Uh, this image, by the way, is not from the South, it's from Boston. But I, I, I think um, if a picture is worth a thousand words, to look at uh, the comparison between the white children and African-American children, uh, reading their body languages and their faces here uh, says mountains of information. So here's what happened. Desegregation resulted in the loss of African-American leadership in communities. This was on purpose and driven by how uh, white uh, leaders uh, dealt with this issue. 
white schools were primarily used after integration. Uh, and uh, there was this feeling that there was no way they were going to go into uh, any kind of uh, African American neighborhood uh, with their schools and their buses. Uh, some of the schools were used as, let's say, a high school for an elementary school, that kind of thing. But many of them school just closed, uh, just due to their location. And a number of black communities, even though they knew that integration was important, that it had to come eventually for the good of the nation and for their good, uh, they also grieved the loss of these schools. And so imagine uh, a rural African American community and who were the most highly educated community in those, uh, highly educated people in those communities. And of course they were the teachers and the principals and so forth because many rural communities had no doctors or lawyers uh, as a part of the African American community. And not only that, they were leaders, but they also uh, were setting the cultural tone. Uh, they were bringing in higher income, which allowed uh, African-American businesses to flourish and so forth. A couple of principals. Uh, the principals generally either became uh, assistant pr principals at a school uh, or they lost their job entirely. In fact, many of them that became assistant principals soon lost their job within a year or two. Um, in April of 1969, when DeKalb announced closing of Hamilton High School, black students walked out of their classrooms to join their parents and community members in a protest march to the courthouse. Uh, in the quotation from one person, it was everything to us, a former student remarked. It was the soul in the center of our community. It was the heart and soul. So here's what you find today, again, as we started. You drive around Georgia and you see these buildings. Martin Allard Elementary School, Brownwood. Um, Scotts Branch High School, Martin Elementary Auditorium. So what does this mean to preservation? And let me just throw out that uh, it has to be multifaceted. And we have to look at significance, I think, in a whole different way than we might look, because if it just has to do with the architecture of these buildings, as I pointed out very early on, these buildings are all, all over the country uh, from this uh, international style era. But the association of the story uh, to this era is, is an important thing. So I think there are some of these structures that can be interpreted and preserved although probably not all of them, uh, related to the recent past, uh, connected to their narratives, and of course, in keeping with whatever economic opportunities we can find. The structures when interpreted will at least help us to think about uh, something about this era uh, because they're extant, and again, they don't have this negative baggage that many uh, other things in the landscape do. Um, in healthcare, there was a term used, uh, the deluxe Jim Crow era, and it didn't insinuate that their uh, life and plight was any better. It simply said that in uh, the area of healthcare, it was important to realize that if African Americans got sick, white people could get sick. Uh, and so there was a ratcheting up of the quality of healthcare during the same period. And by the same token, uh, there was a huge political reason uh, for the state of Georgia to try to, at least on the surface, improve uh, the educational uh, facilities that students went to. So this is something that I think deserves interpretation. And uh, so there aren't many examples of things being done right now, but uh, two that I know about, Vienna High and Industrial School uh, is uh, uh, going to be uh, a community center uh, here um, shown uh, in a close-up from the uh, interior. And then if we go to um, Decatur, um, the uh, Beacon community was actually an African-American community that 
most of the houses were raised even before these school buildings uh, were uh, through urban renewal uh, and, and other projects. And so then more recently, beginning in uh, the middle of the last decade, um, they came up with a plan that would have a new community center and municipal center on the site of uh, Beacon Elementary and uh, Trinity High School. And what they did is essentially uh, create this new building, uh, use some of the skeleton of the building that was there, and then tried in some way to uh, interpret. Um, uh, this was uh, a very contentious situation, uh, especially for the African American uh, community, but uh, that particular project uh, has been done and, and, and built. So that uh, takes me to the end and uh